Greetings customizers, and here we go with the first episode in the next series, and it's all about airbrushing. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the channel. For my subscribers, thank you very much. I appreciate you, and we are going to kick off with the airbrushing series. So, uh, for those of you who are new here, uh, and those of you who might forget, I like to break things down into nice simple steps so that anybody can follow along, because I like taking complex problems and making them a bunch of smaller simple problems so we can work uh, through an issue. In this case, the issue is how do we get better control when spraying our paint onto a model? The answer is an airbrush. So what we're going to do is uh, just take a quick look here. There's a couple of types of airbrush. This one is uh, a Neo made uh, for, uh, by Iwata, and there's loads of different companies out there. Um, if I were to make a recommendation, I will recommend this one because um, you can get simpler airbrushes and more complex airbrushes. I find this one to be nicely middle of the road. Um, without being overly stressful. Uh, the airbrush itself is a simple tool. What it does is it takes pressurized air, mixes it with thinned paint in a Venturi, and then shoots it out. Bottom line. So, you have the main body of the airbrush here with this cup attached. There's two kinds of airbrushes in that regard. You have a gravity feed, and you have a siphon feed. A gravity feed is basically exactly like what it sounds. You pour th thinned paint in here, and gravity pushes down on that paint, which puts it into the uh, airflow, and then it comes out, and then you get your paint. Siphon feed is this, the exact opposite. So you're fighting gravity, and it's basically a, a suction action, so to speak, that draws the paint up into the airflow and uh, shoots it out. I prefer gravity feed. Some people might swear by siphon feed. That's something you got to shoot, uh, shoot from the hip from and basically make your own decision. If you are absolutely indecisive, I say go with gravity feed, because why not let science do the work for you? I'm sure there's science in the siphon feed, but I had one before and I didn't like it. So anyway, um, yeah, and then uh, this is also a, a dual action airbrush. There are two kinds. There's dual action and single action. Dual action basically allows you to uh, control not only the amount of paint coming out, but also the airflow, whereas the single action only gives you uh, one shot, and that's just a straight up and down action. This one, you can go up and down and back. So... By drawing this back, you can see this uh, chuck moving back here. That's where the needle goes. And basically, up and down is how much air comes out. And back and forth is how much paint comes out. So single action is just how much air. Double action is air and paint. Okay. So with that, we talked about the chuck. Let's talk about the needle itself. As you can see, it's a very fine point needle. You can totally stab yourself with this, but don't. Um, it needs to be kept straight and it needs to be kept clean. So it goes into this little hole in the back here, and bear with me because I'm doing this behind a camera. Oh, that was good. Um, basically, you push it all the way forward till it can't go forward anymore, and you can see it coming out that little nozzle there. You see that? Yeah, that's how fine this thing is. Um, and that's not to say you can't do area work with it, okay? So we're just, we're just talking about the fineness of it so you can appreciate the machining skill that went into something like this. Then you attach this cap here, and what that cap does is... Uh, sorry, I'll... Before I overshoot here, you can see the needle comes out, right? That's where the paint comes out. Let's just focus. That hole just above my thumbnail there is where the air comes out. Okay, so you got the needle, you got the paint hole and the air hole. And by putting this cap on, it forces them to mix together. And what it does is shoots out that little hole. And you can actually see the needle protruding. So if you look, focus on the, uh, the cap here, you'll see the needle moving back and forth, okay? And then there, paint comes out there. And so that it's comfortable to sit in your hand, you just put this little cap on top like this. And then you attach an air hose to it, like this. It just screws on. Do it finger tight, don't reef on the damn thing. Um, everybody's so concerned about making things super tight, just needs to be finger tight. And there's your airbrush right there. This air hose, where does it go? I'm glad you asked. Goes down to an air compressor. This is a little hobby version I bought at uh, an art store. You can see compared to my hand there how small it is. They come in different shapes and sizes. There's a few important things here. So the air compressor itself is basically a motor that compresses air and shoves it up the hose into the airbrush, which allows you to do your thing. It should have heat dissipation fins on it somewhere or a vent system, so just be careful with that because it can get pretty warm, so you don't want anything on there that could... I won't say it'll melt, but it might deform or something like that. 
You've got the regulator itself. Mine's a, a push, pull, twist and lock kind of deal with the uh, pressure gauge there. It's measured uh, in tens with lower hash marks and it's measured in pounds per square inch. Down here, you've got the moisture trap. And what that does is it sucks all the moisture or it prevents moisture from getting into the line. And then it's got a little purge valve down there. Absolutely indispensable. You don't want that water shooting up your hose through your airbrush because it'll screw up your paint. So if you buy a compressor without an, uh, a water trap or a moisture trap, then make sure you get one and attach it. And then you got the hose here that goes all the way back up to the airbrush. That's the basic airbrush system itself. Now there's the peripherals. So I'm just going to pull uh, back here a little bit. And one of the peripherals is a spray booth. You can certainly make your own. There's tutorials on YouTube. Uh, it's cheaper. Fill your boots. However, in this case, I've got two of them hooked up side by side for larger projects like, you know, mores, for example. What they do is when you turn them on, mine has lights as well around the side here, is when you turn them on, a fan is in the back there and what it does is it sucks all the fume, fumes and uh, excess paint, that the atomized paint that might be floating around through this filter, catches in the filter and it can lead outside to a window or a catchment uh, material behind or whatever and basically what it does is it arrests the uh, fine mist that will come out of your airbrush. Um, if that sounds weird, it's not. It's basically, it'll, this will throw paint at what you want to hit, but because you're doing it at whatever PSI, there will be some paint because it's atomized, right? It's interacting with the air around you that will go other places. So this basically alleviates that and it keeps the, the fumes down. Speaking of fumes, regardless of whatever kind of paint you use, I want everybody to get themselves one of these. And this is what's going to keep the paint from going into your lungs. So um, you can get them at any, I think hobby stores sell them. I know paint stores sell them and hardware stores sell them. So really there's no excuse because even if you live in a crappy little town, they should have a hardware store that uh, sells these. If not, you can order them online. Um, replacement cartridges and filters. Filters start off white. When they start being not white, it's a good time to replace them. And like any sort of PPE, personal protective equipment, you want to make sure you have a good seal. This one goes over my head and around the back of my neck and hugs my ugly mug quite nicely right around here. Um, it'll be a little bit more effort to breathe, but not as much effort as it is trying to breathe through dried paint in your lungs. So let's uh, I'll get one of these, okay? Goggles or safety glasses are, in my opinion probably necessary, but I treat them as optional because sometimes, quite frankly, their um, optical value is just not good enough to see some of the detail I want to do. So I'll leave that up to you. But certainly goggles or safety glasses are encouraged. And that's really all there is to it. Um, an optional piece of equipment when you're cleaning your airbrush is a cleaning station. The airbrush itself goes right into there. And when you just shoot uh, cleaner or thinner through it, it basically blasts everything out into this jar. And eventually when you want to, you empty this out somewhere environmentally responsibly. And uh, that's about the size of it. Not really required. Um, and that's about the size of it. So those are the components of an airbrush. And I think what we're going to do is uh, we'll move to a nice little swaggy uh, intro. But... Uh, We'll just talk about what we're going to do. So most of the process stays the same as it was, as it would be for aerosol cans. The best thing being is that you have way more control over how much paint uh, and how much blast you get with an airbrush. So in this case, uh, this is my Iron Grenadier Skyhawk, which I have yet to name. Uh, this was all done with an airbrush. So yeah, it's simple blocked color like other projects. So you may be asking, what's the whole point? Well, there's a few points behind it. One. You can get paint into these nacelles, for example, and into this uh, air vent in here, whatever you want to call it, way easier with an airbrush than you can with spray cans. Um, because you can control how much air is going in there. So you can just put a little soft application of paint in there that covers everything just nicely, rather than holding a spray can up to it, crossing your fingers, and basically assuming the crash position. Um, so the, the real thing that comes from this is control. The next thing that comes with it is paint variety. So you could go to four different hardware stores, Walmart, whatever you want to do, and you will see a shelf of paint and there's maybe three or four companies-ish that put out spray paint, but the colors are pretty limited. Once you get into an airbrush, you can use any paint that's that can be thinned for an airbrush and most paints can be thinned for an airbrush. So your Warhammer paints, 
even your craft paints that you buy at the dollar store or whatever, hobby paints, gaming paints, uh, and you can use different colors from different lines, just like you could with anything else, really, but you can all shoot them through the same airbrush, which is fantastic. So something like this, if I'm uh, cooking full tilt boogie, I can do this whole thing in an hour less than, and that's switching colors, cleaning the airbrush and everything. Imagine how much time it would take to finish this if you were doing spray cans. Is the weather okay outside? Is the uh, is it enamel? Okay, so it, yeah, even if it's fast drying enamel, well, it's still kind of tacky because it's humid in the garage or whatever, blah, 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 blah. This is all done with acrylics. Um, and I was done it in less than an hour. So uh, quite frankly, aside from the uh, all weather benefits of the airbrush, it increases your productivity, if you will, by being able to do more faster. That's not saying you should rush or that you need to do more faster. But it just won't take you as long for each individual product, provided everything goes according to plan. Now, as much as I love airbrushing, and when I started doing these videos, I actually stepped back to spray painting, um, which I don't do nearly as much anymore because of the airbrush. Um, I will say that I adore the heck out of airbrushing. That's not to say that things can't go wrong. Um, you can get a bad paint mix. You can get... Uh, you know, if you don't clean your airbrush properly, which is a big deal, um, you can get contaminated paint, you can get clogs, all that kind of stuff. They're easily fixed, but it's one more step that you got to take care of. Um, but the good news is, is that if you use paints, let's say craft paints, for example, and your spouse uses craft paints for their arts and crafts time, you can share the same paints and that way colors don't go to waste. If you do this enough, I promise you that none of the paints you have will ever go to waste. Um, but there it is. So you've got an Iron Grenadier's Skyhawk. All done with the airbrush. Yeah, I think that's about the size of it. A little bit of a dramatic pause there. I was like, what am I going to do next? Um, we're at 12 minutes already, so let's call this the intro. Um, on the last video series there, when I finished off that Slaughter's Marauder's uh, Shark, I actually owe you guys a presentation shot with Deep Six. Right, give me one sec. Here we go. Sorry about the no background music, but I'm still setting up my hobby room. Uh, and I don't have tunes. I don't have appropriate tunes yet. Let's leave it at that. So, y'all remember the um, Slaughter's Marauder's Grizzly from the previous series? There's the driver. Slaughter's Marauder's Deep Six. Uh, I think it worked quite nicely. I use slightly different paint for the figure than the vehicle because if you look at the two, they're actually different colors when you look at like Sergeant Slaughter or Barbecue or whatever compared to the Lynx. The colors are slightly different, not to mention the blue. But there you have it. As promised, the Slaughter's Marauder's Grizzly with Driver Deep Six. So much fun. And for those of you who skipped this series, shame on you, but it was brush painted and a, load of, and a lot of fun. Okay. So why don't we cut to an intro now and then we'll talk about the project that we're going to do because it's going to be another twofer. So we're going to do airbrushing, but then we're going to do something special with the airbrush with a special product that you can't replicate with anything else, in my opinion. More about that later. So intro, please. Okay, so we're set up and ready to go here. Uh, what I've done is... Uh, for whatever reason, I can't find a screwdriver fitting these screws. Uh, that's part of the gear shift mechanism for the Mobat. So what all I've done is I've stuffed some damp paper towel here uh, into my turret ring. And the great thing is, is that you can be, you can have way more control putting paint around this. But I'm not too worried about paint inside this because you won't see it once the turret's on. Um, I will have to hit the, the outside rim of this and that's no problem. So I'm just covering this to keep as much paint off of the uh, gear shifter as possible. Uh, I've chosen to start with the hull because uh, as per our Tiger Force Mobat videos, there's lots of greeblies in here. And for those of you just joining us, welcome to the channel. And my greeblies, I mean lumps and bumps and in this case grills and fuel tanks and shovels and all sorts of stuff on there that can deny the complete coverage of your paint. But we won't let it get away with that now, will we? So what I've got here is uh, I've got some Vallejo airbrush thinner. 
And I've got Vallejo Black Primer, which if you recall, we used uh, on other projects. So that's what I'll be using. And um, I also have some dollar store mixing cups here. And for thinning paint for an airbrush, uh, you can absolutely mix it in the cup or the jar of your airbrush. However, um, over a few years of practice, I've decided that I prefer mixing it in an exterior cup and then pouring it into the airbrush. The advantages of that I found were uh, working with gloss paints where you pour the paint in first or even the thinner in first, you have to mix it so it becomes homogenous. And that becomes more difficult to do um, depending on the paint itself. So you can get out any errors or if you don't like the color, if you have to hand mix and you don't like the color you mixed, it's best to do it in a cheap exterior cup so you don't have to spend time cleaning out the airbrush to then reset it. Um, and that's not to dissuade you because like I said, the airbrush is the most versatile and effective way to apply paint to a uh, vehicle in my humble opinion. So uh, it doesn't matter which one you add first in this case. So I've already shaken up my uh, primer. You don't have to shake up the thinner, you just pour that in. So I'm gonna put a good healthy amount in there based off of what I think I'll need. Now a good healthy amount may not seem like much and it's really not. And once I thin that, that will go quite a long way. Uh, with a primer or if you're using one individual color, you don't have to worry about remixing the right amount or whatever. There can be some inconsistencies in how much pr uh, primer versus or paint versus thinner you use. Um, there are multiple ratios out there and multiple opinions. So what I will tell you to de-stress the whole thing is you should be looking for something roughly the equivalent of skim milk. Um, if you don't know what that looks like, then uh, you'll just have to experiment. And basically what you want at the end of the day is, that's actually not too bad. It might even be just a little bit too much, but I'm just gonna stir that up a bit. Uh, you can use whatever you like, a toothpick or what have you. I'm gonna use uh, a brush because that could uh, help me out later. So I've got some clean water and a nice clean brush here. And I'm just gonna mix that around just a, a few swirls. And all I'm doing is making sure that the thinner and the paint blend together. Um, you want that mix homogenous because that might actually even be still a little too thick. Yeah, I'll put a little more thinner in there. And it's a judgment call. You can get little cups like this that have measurements on them and you can be very precise if you wish. Uh, that's not my style, so I'm not doing it. Uh, I'm going to put a little bit more in there. And I'm just squeezing based off of um, basically a, a ballpark, if you will. And I apologize if that's not precise enough for some folks, that's, uh, that's certainly possible. And now all I'm doing is I'm brushing the paint up the side of the, the cup here and seeing how it behaves. So I think we're actually pretty good there. Uh, with Vallejo pigment, it's designed to be mixed with an airbrush, for an airbrush. So uh, in my opinion, I think that's good enough. So we're gonna go from there. And then all I do is even though there's Vallejo thinner mixed in there, I'm gonna put it back in water and I'm just gonna swiggle that off. That's not gonna really screw anything up later if I have to do some brush painting. Um, we'll be just fine. For the purists out there, yeah, if you wanna keep everything 100% separated and sanitized, uh, that's up to you. So uh, now I'm gonna load this into my airbrush. And all that is, is pouring it in. And you'll see that just that little bit almost fills the cup. And in this airbrush, I do have a cap on this, but I like to uh, tempt fate and not use it. But if you're shaking your airbrush or doing very short squiggly patterns, uh, you can get paint pouring over the side like this. And if it goes over the front and blows in, well, then you have some problems. But um, we're not gonna be worrying about it like that. Right now, the application is just gonna be an even layer of color. Uh, again, for those of you just joining, when I do my customs, my aesthetic that I choose is basically a what if scenario. What if Hasbro continued to make uh, G.I. Joe vehicles in the sub teams they created uh, much like they did in the uh, late 80s. So I'll take a regular vehicle like this Mobat and make it Python Patrol, Tiger Force, or in this case, Sky Patrol. So um, I've already done my pre-visualization. I broke it down into parts. Uh, pre-visualization is making sure that your idea is the right one uh, for you uh, without putting any paint on first. So in this case, I chose what I was going to chrome and what I was going to leave black and what I was going to make tan and what I was going to make gray and what I was going to make white. Sky Patrol has quite the mix of colors. Um, so in this case, this is going to be chromed 
and although the paint I'm using for the chrome is quite special and doesn't need a primer, I'm going to show you how to prime something or lay down a block color uh, because that pattern of behavior needs to be replicated for everything else. And you may not have a final color, let's say yellow, for example, that can't go down without a primer. So we're going to show the priming phase and then the painting phase, uh, even though in this case it's technically not required, but that's due to the product I'm using, not um, the technique required to get the paint sticking to this plastic. So I'm just going to put this back in my handy dandy airbrush cradle for a second while I get everything else set up. There we go. So with this video, what all I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I apply even coats of um, paint onto a surface. I'm going to have to put my mask on here because safety first and uh, we're going to go from there. So give me a few minutes or seconds or whatever in between applications to uh, stop to describe something to you if I have to because I have to turn on my filter as well. So uh, on my airbrush spray booth here. So bear with me. I'm just going to mask up and get everything turned on and then I'm going to start spraying. So just a quick break there, you can see that the best way to apply this is by going off the edge of the model and spraying in a nice straight even line to go off the opposite edge of the model. It's not required in this case because with the airbrush you can control, especially with a dual action airbrush like this one, you can control how much paint and how much air comes out so you can very softly and gently apply paint. The other thing that you saw me do was do some individual shots in there and that was just to get the paint into the nooks and crannies. Now in this case, um, depending on how deep those are, you may still need to go in there with a brush. So uh, nothing is infallible, and while this is certainly more efficient, um, the brush never disappears from your repertoire. So I'm going to carry on with the rest of this hull here, and I'll stop and do certain things slowly. So just pay attention to what I'm doing, and I'll talk about it afterwards. But the pattern is going to stay the same for the rest of the painting application. So here we go.
So we'll pause there for a minute. As you can see, I covered pretty much the whole hull of the tank. I'll still have to go under and do the underneath because that'll be slightly visible as well. Um, and the same thing applies. So I've got about 99% of the hull done. And I did all of that with just that little bit of paint. So right now my cup, my cup runneth dry, but I still have some mixed in here. So that whole battery mixed in the first place, while it didn't seem like much, certainly carried out most of the task that we required of it. So as you can see, a little brush, a little bit of paint goes a long way with an airbrush, and that's what I love about it. So one or two jars of this will last you several projects. So I'm going to carry on with uh, this aspect, and I'll get the other parts primed up, and we will go from there. So just hang on. Okay, and for these next parts here, what I've done is I've taken a Q-tip with some blue poster tack and put it onto this uh, road wheel here. And I've also got the back plate here. So these ones will actually be accepting a different color other than that chrome product. So we're going to make sure that we have good application here so the paint has really something to grab onto. And the reason why I'm showing you these parts is because if you're not familiar with the Mobat, it's got a lot of deep grooves in there, as you can see. I might even need to clean them out a little bit more. And uh, what I've done is I've turned down the air pressure on my air compressor, which gives me even more control. And I've thinned my paint a little bit more, so the paint's going to come out much finer. And what that does is it lets me spend some time in there to ensure I've got coverage without letting the paint pool in there. So a thinner paint requires more coats, but gives you far more control with the airbrush. So I'm going to carry on with that right now.
And there you have coverage on the turret. Uh, everywhere I pointed was somewhere that was a detail area to do or a reminder of to make sure you get paint everywhere you wanted. In this case, I double tapped at the barrel tip to make sure you put some black paint in there. Um, and I employed the Lazy Susan here so I could keep airbrushing without touching any wet paint. So right now I'm just waiting for the rest of that to dry. But as you can see, the coverage is quite excellent. I even lifted up and got under the barrel. Um, the camera angle might not have been ideal for that one, but uh, it's my first time trying to do this with an airbrush over a phone. So uh, please bear with me. The shots will improve as we go along. And there you have it. So I've shown you a detailed part in the road wheel. I've shown you some nooks and crannies on the turret here. I've shown you some greebly work on the main hull. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Uh, once you mix the paint to the consistency of about skim milk, keep your air pressure light very low on your air compressor. And when I speak to that, some people like to airbrush at 18 PSI. Some people like to airbrush at 40 PSI. That's something for you to discover what you like, which is why I did those test shots on the paper towel first, is to see if the airbrush, uh, if the paint came out the way I wanted it to, because you have full control over that. And if you're not happy, don't accept something that's not ideal. So we're going to leave it there for the basic uh, primer application and the basics of applying airbrush paint. Um, you can see here I've got some on the paper towel and that's fine. That's what it's there for. So in this video we talked about uh, the basics of the airbrush itself, the basics of applying paint. And like I've just shown you, it's actually not that hard. I won't say that there is not a learning curve for airbrushing. There absolutely is. But don't let that intimidate you. By all means, experiment on paper towels or spare parts or spare vehicles that you don't care about first before you start committing paint to plastic. But uh, that's really all there is to it. So without further ado, I'm going to get the rest of things primed up. And then what I'll do is I will show you the application of some colors, especially when you're priming over black. And then we will move on to the chrome bits. So remember to be safe, wear your mask, take your time and be patient. And remember, above all else, have fun.